It's the Daily Dog. Hey everybody, what's going on? Thanks for being with me for today's episode of the Daily Dog. You made it. It's a big episode today. Are you ready? Octavarium. Dream Theater. It's the day. We've done it. We've made it. Today is Octavarium Day. And y'all, I'm excited. Uh, as you can tell, I'm also a little bit nervous. <laughs> Dream Theater. The musicians in Dream Theater challenge my musicianship like no other band I've heard. Uh, with maybe the exception of Rush, uh, uh, which... Uh, is uh, there? It, it's incredible music, all of it, right? So I'm having so much fun doing all of these big, bad, bodacious songs. And uh, today we're doing Octavarium. Um, three weeks ago, three weeks ago today, in fact, uh, was the last time that we put out a um, a reaction to a Dream Theater song, and that was The Count of Tuscany. And I have to say, The Count of Tuscany is, to this day, in my top five of all the songs that I've reviewed on this channel. Just an epic, wonderful piece of music. So I have high hopes for Octavarium. In fact, it wasn't long <laughs> after I posted The Count of Tuscany that the drum beat, Octavarium, <laughs> from all corners of my YouTube channel. Just, just y'all are ready for it. I'm ready for it. We're going to dive in today. Um, I did some homework last night. So first, a little bit of background. Uh, I did some homework last night, read through a little bit about the piece. It's, it's interesting to me from an overall schematic uh, point of view. So Octavarium is the eighth studio album by Dream Theater. It was released in June of 2005. And uh, just reading through a bit of how they conceived of the album, uh, it's kind of arbitrary. It's like, hey, it's our eighth album. Hey, eight means octave. We should just kind of just uh, look at uh, that development and, uh, and use that as a way to organize our musical ideas. So they have eight songs on the album, and the first one starts with F, and then they end up with the eighth song, Octavarium, being the eighth song on the eighth album of, uh, of Dream Theater, at least the eighth studio album. And uh, I have to say, just as, as an aside, uh, as a composer, when you're going into a very large scale piece, like uh, the guys at Dream Theater were doing for this record, this is a record, a piece of, of art that's over an hour long. And when you're going to start trying to figure out how you're going to arrange and organize your musical ideas for such an epic piece of art, uh, it helps to have some bit of scaffolding uh, to help you just from an arbitrary uh, standpoint, start organizing your ideas or having a point of view. Because I gotta tell you, there is nothing scarier as a composer than a blank sheet of paper and no point of view, right? So just coming up with, hey, it's our eighth album, we should focus on the octave and lay out our stuff this way. It's just a way to start so that you can dive in and have a little bit of swimming room, uh, or at least you're, it's almost like defining the area of the game field so that you know what type of game you're playing. And then you can be creative within the scaffolding that you've created or set up for that piece. It's really a smart thing to do, and it does definitely help, especially if you have writer's block, uh, just to give yourself some, some points of view to then start working from, and you can uh, do your thing. Uh, I have looked at the lyrics and I actually, a couple times, the lyrics are fascinating to me and uh, just all over the map, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll see what we can come up with. This is a long piece, y'all. It's 24 minutes long. I'm going to try to get through this with as few interruptions of the music as possible, but uh, let's take a deep breath. I think we're ready. Uh, I'm doing this late morning, so I've, I've got an extra bit of coffee to get me through, and uh, I think we're ready. Are you? Okay, Dream Theater, Octavarium. This is the studio recording, and uh, let's hit it. Here we go. Mm 
that sounds like an F. F minor triad. I love the album art. Time ticking away. And there's eight spheres, right? The first and the octave. Perfect spheres. You end where you start, right? F minor down to D flat minor, and then back to F. Up to A flat minor. Yeah. Back to F. Okay, that's interesting. Those three chords all have an A flat in common. There they go again. It's a pivot. They'd use an A flat as the third of a chord, a fifth of a chord, and the root of a chord. And they're all minor chords. It's a chromatic third shift that uh, a lot of composers use. In fact, I was listening to Rush again last night. Rush does that quite a bit too. This, these chromatic thirds or chromatic mediant relationships. All, all over an F pedal, sounds like. I didn't expect to hear a steel guitar. It's normally country music. Minor five down to minor four. Back up to one, F minor. The mix is fantastic. The bass goes up to G, the bass goes up to A flat. Relative major, A flat. Down to the five chord, C major, um, Back to Tippets F major. The mix is unbelievable. Yeah, 
There's those chromatic thirds again. F minor. D flat minor. Cool. I never wanted to become someone like him. So secure. Content to live each day just like the last. I was sure I knew that. So either on the move. This was Whoa! Not for me. All of a sudden they're in a sharp key. See how brighter that is? How much? And I wanted so much more far beyond what I could see. So I swore that I'd never become someone. Wow. F sharp? Back down to F, okay. F minor. Okay, so we skipped ahead. So many years have passed. They're still in like the, the verse, right? Of the first section, so they've already skipped ahead 30 years or, or several years. Yeah, they did that before. It's, it's like a C to an F sharp toggle. To They're all over the place. Wow. FOMO, fear of missing out. They're over B. Is it dominant? Lovely vocals. Turns minor over five to five. Minor five. Then a half step. And now it's a dominant over A. A major. A minor. I wanted to become to be someone just like you. Okay, new section. I need I, I need to take a break. Holy buckets, y'all. Uh there's so much in that first section. Someone like him. Um, the first part, I'm, I'm looking at the lyrics here. I never wanted to become someone like him, uh, content to live each day like the last. And then they get to this next little bit, and it says, so many years have passed since I proclaimed. Right? So it's, I don't know if it's it's both in the present and the past, or they're, rec uh, so it's, it's complicated. Uh, hashtag dream theater. It's complicated. <laughs> But uh, a little bit further down, as far as I could tell, there's nothing more I need. But still, I ask myself, could this be everything that I all I swore that all I would never be was now? So suddenly, the only thing I wanted to become is to be someone just like him. So I don't know who him is. Is this a father figure? Is this a uh, musical mentor? Uh, not sure. But they're all over the joint. And again, it seems like what they're doing is taking uh, uh, single notes and doing chromatic pivots around them. That first little bit, there was an A flat in that F minor chord, and that's the third of that chord. Then it turns into the fifth of a D flat minor chord, and then it turned into the root of an A flat minor chord. And uh, they were doing more of that, uh, and it's how they get slippery 
from like flat keys to sharp keys because as soon as you take one note and you sort of pivot the other notes by like uh, in that chord by a half step or a whole step and you create this whole other chord, you get into a different realm, like a different quadrant of the circle of fifths and it really opens the, um, the harmonies up uh, and uh, all bets are off. So this is the second section, Medicate. I'm going to go back just a hair and we're going to keep rolling. Bass. I think you're in A. A major. Minor four. Cool. A is in all of these chords. You're doing the same thing. D to F. Back to A. It's the root of this chord. The fifth of that chord. And the third of that chord. Science failing, conscience fading fast. Who's 
sensing. C sharp to C, back to C sharp to A minor. Yeah. They call this section full circle. At least the notes come full circle. I was interested in these lyrics though. They went back to F. Yeah. So seven? Seven? Seven. Sailing on the seven seas that they trip by. We're more than halfway there. So we're in the third section. <sighs> this is unreal. Un I'm so into this. So th I think we I figured out who him is in the first section. The, I think they're referring to uh, not a particular person per se, but maybe all of their influences uh, musically, it looks like they're going back through time and they're dropping in all of these references. So in this section, uh, Day Tripper, oh gosh, uh, uh, from the Beatles, uh, Carpe Diem, uh, Jack the Ripper, Wilson Phillips, Supper's Ready is Genesis, right? Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, uh, Diamond Dave, is that David Lee Roth? <laughs> uh, uh, da, 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 uh, gosh, there's so many of these. Um, uh, Machine Messiah, Light My Fire, Gabba Gabba, Hey Hey, that could be the monkeys, or it could be uh, Neil Young, I think, My Generation, Home Again. It's, uh, which, uh, the lyrics in this section are really, really clever, y'all. Uh, I think they're going back and just sort of uh, paying homage to all of their musical mentors and their influences. Uh, neat stuff. Five eight. The 
most progressive, intense part of the song that we've got to yet. Ascending scale. Y'all have to listen to that section with your headphones on. That was mixed unbelievably cool. Feeling? I have a feeling that they may be referencing some of the musical licks in these old in, uh, from these uh, references that they've included in the lyrics, but I don't know the repertoire well enough to know that for sure. But there's a couple of them like that's familiar, that's familiar, but in a <laughs> in a dream theater <laughs> setting or a dream theater way, crazy stuff. Almost there. Uh, <laughs> I have to go back and 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 think about what we just heard before we uh, we experience the end. Thanks for being on the journey with me. Okay, this fourth section is called intervals, and I I don't think I would have heard it if I wasn't looking at the lyrics. And they say first, and then second, and then third, and then fourth, and they're going up. Uh, all of these different steps. And I think I read in my reading last night that uh, in this section, they're referencing their own songs. In the last section, they're referencing all of their musical mentors that have come before them that sort of influenced uh, and them and led the way uh, for this band. And now I think they're referring to the other songs on the album, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and, uh, and now they said at the end of that, they're trapped inside this octavarium. So I looked up the meaning of the word octavarium in the dictionary, and it doesn't exist. This is a word that they've made up, but I think they're talking about how it, uh, uh, where was my notes on this? Um, 
the meaning of it itself uh, is this, um, oh, where'd it go? Shucks. Um, ah, um, like a, um, we end where we begin. And I think I, I go back to the, uh, the, the album art, the spheres, right? So uh, there's no uh, linear path. There's no, uh, you know, walking the yellow brick road. The yellow brick road itself is on a sphere. We all live on a globe, <laughs> right? We're just, you know, floating along. And there's no straight way to get to the destination. And by the time we get to the destination, we're so full of the memories from the journey that the destination and the journey are intertwined and are basically the same. And we end where we begin. A perfect sphere colliding with our fate. The story ends where it begins. And I think when they say that they're trapped inside of it, uh, by this time, this is their eighth album. And if they're paying homage for all of the people that have come before them and influenced them, now their style and their music has become mature and they've staked their place in the ground and they're like, this is what we stand for. This is what we sound like. This is our perspective. This is our point of view. And now that they have that, it's set. And that's their sphere. That's their journey. And they're, they have to live in that now because they, they won't be able to really undo all of the journey that's already taken place. I think that's what they're talking about. If I'm just way off base, I'm sure y'all will let me know. But um, I'm talking a little bit to give my, my heart a second to relax <laughs> so that I can uh, get prepared for this ending section, this, this final, this final uh, push, the razor's edge. And I love that they have real strings and the, and the flute at the beginning. What are the same progressions from the opening section? D, then the C sharp. Perfect sphere colliding with our fate. The story ends where it began.
playable cadence. It's nature! The story continues. Oh, y'all. Wow. What are you going to say? I mean, okay. The, the last thing, the, 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 the end, again, as with the end, the, some of the other stuff, the last few minutes is just like the perfect thing. But it can only be that powerful if everything else that sets it up is part of a really well-constructed narrative. And if you're into it and you get the meaning of it, it just blows you away. I am, consider me blown, y'all. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, you know... I, th uh, the, the ending with those horns, um, it ends on that, finally ends on that major chord, that major F chord, and those horns went to the minor sixth. They've been doing that a lot, a major, uh, sometimes when they're in a major key, but those minor four chords is mixing between the minor key and the major key, and those horns went up to the minor sixth, which in that key is a D flat, but for the horns, because they, they transpose down to fifth, it's a high A flat. For the horns down to their that resolves down to their G, and it's the top heroic part of their range. Perfectly written, perfectly voiced. I have nothing bad to say about that, uh, other than uh, when can I listen again? Uh, unbelievable, unbelievable, unbelievable. How do they do that? Uh, great stuff. In fact, uh, uh, I, I, I wonder if I'm on the right track, y'all. Y'all can help me out. We're 38 minutes in. I knew this was going to be a long video. Uh, I really don't care. Uh, this song deserves my full attention and all of the energy that I can muster. Uh, for them, for, for their uh, unbelievable uh, piece, and for all of you listening and going on the journey uh, with me. I have seen doctoral dissertations by composers that didn't come close to this in terms of scope, meaning, structure, uh, chops, everything. Instrumentation, orchestration, performance, all of that. Um, it's one of the most uh, brilliant um, pieces of music in this genre that I've ever experienced. And... Um, Can't wait to listen again. Can't wait to listen again. We move in circles, balanced all the while, all gleaming on, on a, sorry, on a gleaming razor's edge. A perfect sphere colliding with our fate. The story ends where it began. So if we go back to the very beginning of this, if I can figure out how to get back up there. <laughs> There's a lot of lyrics. Uh, when they say that they never wanted to become something like the people uh, in the past, but yet those people are part of their story and part of their education and part of their influence. And uh, their own life experiences combined with their technique and their study and, and what they believe in and what they hold to be true adds up and it allows us to create in the moment as best as we can and and after a while that becomes your style i often tell people people ask me like what is your compositional style i'm like i don't know but composing is uh nothing if if nothing else it's just a series of asking a whole bunch of questions to yourself and then answering them you have a musical problem you find a musical solution again and again and again and again and you just keep plugging away and over time you'll find yourself 
answering similar questions in similar ways. And when you start uh, going to these answers that you like, that make sense to you, that fulfill you as a musician, it sort of becomes your sound. And then that becomes your style and your identity as a musician. And I think that's what these guys are talking about. It's our eighth album and we're now a mature band. We've got a whole litany of, of repertoire. We have established ourselves and for better or worse, we're trapped in it, but we're gonna make uh, it count as best we can. So I think that's what their point of view was on this. Um, if it's not, and if I miss some stuff, let me know. Uh, and uh, uh, I have a feeling that I'm gonna keep coming back to listening to this for many years. Uh, uh, not just the reaction to this, I actually enjoy watching my own reactions because I'm, I, I try to learn from myself about what I can do better and, and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but uh, wow, Dream Theater. I can't say enough good stuff. Y'all, this has been a fun, fun uh, taxing episode, but I'm so happy to have done it and just really fulfilled. And uh, I'm going to, it's going to propel me into the weekend and um, I can't wait to come back next week and we'll keep looking through some more tunes and, uh, and engaging in conversation and uh, musical growth, which you thought with each other. So thanks very much for being with me on the ride and we will see you next time on another edition of the Daily Doug.